Hi friends, hello and welcome to another video. During the World Economic Forum, WF of 2024 in Davos, there were several proponents who uh, expressed concerns about the potential collapse of the Chinese economy. These concerns were primarily driven by the country's um, economic slowdown, which was uh, attributed to a combination of factors, including demographic challenges, which are very real and we're going to talk about a little bit more into detail, the debt crisis, uh, trade tensions, and structural issues, which could all contribute to the slowdown of the Chinese economy. So let us begin with a man called Derek Caesars. Derek Caesars is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and according to him, the primary issue that China faces is its significant decline in its working age population. Mind you, the amount of automation around China is incredible. He says that this demographic shift is expected to lead to a substantial decrease in the country's potential growth rate. Caesars also highlighted the challenges posed by the Chinese government's efforts to control the private sector, which, according to him, has led to a decrease in private investment and innovation, but that I will show us differently. He argues that these controls could further hinder the growth of the Chinese economy and exacerbate the issue of the declining working age population in the decades to come. Furthermore, Caesars pointed out that the Chinese economy is heavy reliant on exports, which makes it vulnerable to external shocks and fluctuations in global demand, for example, wars all around the world. He suggests that the Chinese government should focus on implementing structural reforms to address these issues and to ensure the long-term sustainability of the country's economic growth. Now, let us take a look at Josh Rogan. Uh, he is a columnist at the Washington Post who presented um, his arguments on this potential collapse of the Chinese economy. He proposed that the Chinese economy is facing a significant debt crisis, basically talking about local government debt reaching unprecedented levels. We're going to talk about what Beijing is doing and can do about it. These debt levels, according to him, could lead to a domino effect that would impact the entire economy. He, like Caesars and many other China watchers, also highlighted the demographic challenges faced by China, which are very true, that's factual, particularly the aging population and the declining birth rate. So we will see what can be done and what is being done here in China. Rogin says that this demographic shift, if unattended, could lead to a shrinking workforce and reduced consumer demand, which is true, is factual. He also says that ultimately this would hinder China's economic growth in the future. He also went on to discuss the ongoing trade tensions between China and other major economies, particularly, of course, the United States. These tensions could result in reduced trade and investment, which would further exacerbate the economic slowdown given that, according to him, the Chinese economy is still heavily reliant on exports and investment, something that is also partially true, but we'll talk more about that. Domestic consumption really is on the rise. Let us focus then on some of the specific, specific uh, issues that were mentioned during these uh, speeches by Caesars and Rogan. They pointed to the issues in China's real estate market, particularly the struggles of a major developer such as Evergrande. Uh, they say that this is a sign of an impending economic collapse. Well, let's talk about what the Chinese government has implemented. They have issued different measures to gradually deflate the real estate bubble and address the challenges that are faced by the real estate sector, such as the Evergrande crisis, which was real. These measures include adjustments to monetary policy, which have controlled excessive credit growth, and reduce speculative activities in the real estate market. Beijing has also raised the interest rates and increased the reserve requirement ratio for banks, giving it more stability. They also implemented a very interesting one, property tax reforms. They selected a few cities like Shanghai and Chongqing, and, and they did that to, to curb the speculative buying and to stabilize housing prices. Another measure was the tightening of home purchase restrictions in some cities to 
prevent a speculative buying and to reduce the risk of a housing bubble. They have limited the number of properties that a household can buy, and they have also increased the down payment requirements for second homes. In addition, the CPC is heavily promoting the rental housing market in order to provide more affordable housing options for people and reduce the reliance on home ownership. There are now subsidies and, and tax incentives for rental housing developers and operators. And last but not least, Beijing has restructured and reorganized the debt levels of some of these troubled real estate companies like Evergrande in order to help them improve their financial health. Not only did they provide some financial support, some leniency, but they also introduced new management teams and a more realistic debt restructuring plan. All these measures are gradually deflating the real estate bubble as opposed to 2008 in America and are promoting a more stable and sustainable real estate market in China, something commendable really. Now another specific topic was the economic slowdown. CISO Sam Rogan argued that China's economic growth has been slowing down with its GDP growth missing its target in the second quarter of 2023. According to The Diplomat in their article, What the West Gets Wrong About China's Economy. Now, on this matter, I think it is worth remembering that China's economy has shown extraordinary resilience in the past. Take, for example, 2008. After the financial crisis, China's GDP uh, kept growing at around 7%, while most other countries were experiencing severe economic downturns. It is also worth noting that recent data from surveys show that consumer spending in China has been more resilient than previously realized, with uh, domestic tourism exceeding pre-pandemic levels, for example, and another example is Starbucks, which is planning to open a new store in the country every nine hours for the next three years. That's that's a huge example. But above all, and, and despite recent downgrades, we saw that China's GDP growth outdelivered expectations by reaching 5.4% in 2023, and it is projected to stay above 5% in 2024, which is a very relatively healthy growth rate, according to The Economist in their article, Why China's Economy Won't Be Fixed. And finally, on the topic of the slow growth, let us not forget that the Chinese government has significant assets and resources at its disposal to support the economy in times of crisis, even with local governments, as Rogan was suggesting. For instance, the government has the capacity to release funds through state banks and, and credit controls to stimulate economic activity, something they, they can do at any moment. Also, let us agree that it is extremely suspicious and ignorant to discuss China's slowdown without mentioning the myriad of sanctions the US and its allies have imposed on key sectors of Chinese industry. These ongoing trade tensions between China and the United States have been mentioned as a potential contributor to an economic slowdown by Harvard Business Review. But of course, you won't hear a peep about this from Rogan and Caesars. There's also the topic of China's aging population and declining birth rates that were cited as factors that could lead to a future economic collapse. So let's build the bits of truth about this. What's dishonest from Caesars and Rogan's uh, take is that they overlook what China is actually doing to address the issues, which by the way, is not a China only problem. So let's talk about what China is doing. Beijing has actively addressed its demographic crisis by number one, gradually relaxing the one-child policy, which was officially ended in 2015. Back in 2013, the government allowed couples to have a second child if either parent was an only child. But then in 2015, the policy was further relaxed to allow all couples to have two children. In 2021, the government announced that couples would be allowed to have up to three children now. You see the, the, the reaction to the issues? 
These policy changes aim to encourage couples to have more children, thereby increasing the birth rate and addressing the demographic challenges facing the country down the road. However, their response has not been limited to changes in family planning. The government has also introduced measures to support families and improve the well-being of children. For example, in 2016, the government launched a program to provide free preschool education for children aged 3 to 6. Do they talk about that? No. Now, back in 2021 also, China decided to make the after-school tutoring industry non-profit. This measure was driven by a combination of factors, namely trying to address social inequalities since wealthier families could afford better educational opportunities for their children. By making this industry ginormous, billions of dollars a year, non-profit, the government leveled the playing field and made it less financially burdensome to have larger families. Do you start to connect the dots? Now, with regard to the social security system, in 2017, the government put in March its plan to provide and support universal coverage for the elderly. They have also promoted the development of the elderly care industry to better cater to the growing elderly population. I had the privilege of visiting a couple of centers, both in uh, Xi'an, Zhengzhou, and even in Shanghai. Now, another topic that was mentioned was the high youth unemployment. China's youth unemployment rate has been a cause for concern for a lot of people around the world. And some people suggest that this could contribute to economic instability, but here are some of the aspects that <laughs> were omitted by Rogan and Caesars. Those high unemployment figures that they refer to are cyclical and are typically high in summer where the numbers came out because millions of university graduates come out during summer. But what does China do to, to deal with this issue? First and foremost, they promote entrepreneurship among young people by offering tax incentives, subsidies, and other support to, to, to start uh, their own businesses. They also invest in vocational training programs to equip young people with the skills that are needed for the modern economy, while at the same time, they encourage young people to move to rural areas to find employment, as there is a shortage of skilled workers in those areas. I've also had the opportunity to visit a couple of these projects. All these measures go hand in hand with Beijing providing support to small and medium-sized enterprises, which are major employers of young people. So there you go. There is an issue, but it's being tackled. Now, the last topic uh, that was addressed at Davos was China's slower trade on foreign investment. The truth is that China's economy is not as reliant on foreign trade and investments as it once was. The truth is that domestic consumption is playing a more significant role today in driving growth than it had ever done. Nevertheless, the assumption by Caesars is that the Chinese government's control of the private sector has led to a decrease in private investment and even innovation. But this can be very easily debunked. If you take a look at this Made in China 2025 initiative, which aims to transform the country into a high-tech manufacturing powerhouse, this initiative alone has spurred significant private investment in research and development throughout the nation, as well as innovation in, in sectors such as robotics, artificial intelligence, and new energy vehicles. There's a new energy vehicle brand coming out every single day. But even more relevant is 2023 China's foreign direct investment, reaching a staggering 673 billion yuan in the first nine months of 2023. The top sources of FDI in China in 2023 were France, Germany, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Japan, all of which saw significant increases in their investments compared to the previous year. You didn't hear that from them, did you? Also, the Belt and Road Initiative countries have contributed significantly to the overall FDI growth in China. The influx of foreign investment in China in 2023 not only boosted the country's economy, but also led to the establishment of numerous new foreign invested firms. These developments have further solidified China's position as a global economic powerhouse and a prime destination for foreign investment. 
But scissors and rugging would not want you to hear this. They prefer hyperbole and hypotheticals, as Western media and pundits do. These are just some of the counter arguments and evidence confirming that the Chinese economy is not on the brink of collapse. So there you go. That's it for today. Until I see you guys, take it easy and bye for now. Let me know in the comment section what you think about this video and well, until I see you again, bye bye.